joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ, precious name, oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, at the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings till heaven will crown him, when our journey is complete precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven 286 Oh, we don't have enough time for that. We'll now turn our hymnals to 687 instead. 687. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence. Keep silence before him. Amen. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful, of course, again for us to have this uh, experience of being alive and to study that word and to read that word and to commune together. We thank you, dear Lord, for uh, that wonderful mercy and power that you would display to us every each and every day of our lives. We're grateful, dear Lord, for thy goodness, for all the provisions, and we ask the Heavenly Father that uh, today we uh, focus on what's truly important in our lives, which is your word and thy character. We ask, dear Lord, again, um, for thy Holy Spirit to continue to guide us ever so in that wonderful walk of uh, that narrow path of the Christian walk. And we thank you, dear Lord, um, of your people all over the world, dear Lord, um, working to point um, souls to your word. We're grateful for this opportunity, dear Lord, to um, worship you, and we're grateful. We ask these blessings on behalf of our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Morning. And welcome to this divine service. Welcome to those who are online. Um, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 14 and verses 1 and 2, The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable work. There is none that do it good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And so it is that God is looking for us to look upon him and seek him and desire him or opening him this morning is um m554 five, five, or oh, let me walk with thee please stand oh let me walk with thee my god as he Walked in days of old, place thou my trembling hand in thine, and sweet communion with me hold. 
We now have our sharing by Sister Martha Otter. Hello, once again. I want to share with you this reading from my life today. And um, as we were studying um, today about being a servant um, leadership, and um, in order for um, to be able to be um, leaders, we must um, lead by example. And, um, and this is what this reading is about. It says, be an example to fellow believers. It says, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. By the atmosphere surrounding us, every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected. Our words, our acts, our dress, our deportment, even the expression of the countenance has an influence. Every impulse thus imparted is seed sown, which will produce its harvest. It is a link in the, long, in the long chain of human events, extending we know not whither. By our example, we aid others in the development of good principles. We give them power to do good. In their return, they exert the same influence upon others and they upon still others. Thus, by our unconscious influence, thousands may be blessed. Throw a pebble into a lake and a wave is formed, and another, and another. And as they increase, the circle widens until it reaches the very shore. So with our influence. Beyond our knowledge or control, it tells upon others in blessing or in cursing. And the wider the sphere of our influence, the more good we may do. When those who profess to serve God follow Christ's example, practicing the principles of the law in their daily lives, when every act bears witness that they love God supremely and their neighbor as themselves, then will the church have power to move the world. And if young men make their model an exalted one, having pure morals and firm principles, and if blended with this our availability and true Christian courtesy, there is a refined perfection to the character which will win its way anywhere and a powerful influence will be wielded in favor of virtue, temperance, and righteousness. Such characters will be of the highest value to society, more precious than gold. Their influence is for time and for eternity. So just as, I, as we know, I think all of us as children as well as adults 
have thrown a pebble into a, a pool of water, and we've seen how that pebble has um, its effects, and it just keeps on uh, creating waves after wave. And this is the, the, um, the example that is given as to how each one of us can have an influence impact upon others. We can be that, um, that pebble that will have an influence upon others just by the way that we live. And um, we've been left that example in the life of Christ. And the only way that we can um, have knowledge of what that example is, is by reading the Bible. In the Bible, it has been left um, an example of the pattern that we are to follow. And it is um, my fervent um, prayer for me, as well as for each one of us, that we uh, continue to study that model so that we can one day be found without spot or blemish. Our children's story this morning has been brought to us by Brother Atera. This children's story comes from the book of Matthew, um, chapter 3, and it's a very, um, very popular event. Many Christians know about this. It's um, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You remember that? Isn't that nice? Uh, when Daniel was young, there's one of the things that I found interesting um, was that he was always um, into signs. I mean, a little boy, I remember, two, three years old, like signs. I thought that was kind of strange, you know. Usually kids are into trucks, and, you know, but he likes signs. Um, and there were all kinds of signs. Um, office, you know, he would like to label the rooms. You know, if it was the office, he would want a sign that says office. And um, one time he wanted a, a sign that says no trespassing. Then after a while, he started just collecting signs. Some of them said, keep out, right? Um, he labeled the, the bathrooms, too. It says bathroom. Uh, danger, poison, even the uh, nuclear signs. <laughs> so it says nuclear, uh, keep back. Um, this stuff was OK. There was one sign I didn't like, though. You know, it was like, um, it said, forget the owner, forget the dog, beware the owner, or something like that. I said, no, no, let's not get that. <laughs> uh, give, give it bad impressions about our home, right? But all these signs were, uh, it, it were informative. They, they gave directions. Um, they gave guidance. There was no mistake. You know, if, you, if you looked at a door, you saw a sign, and it says, woman's bathroom, then you knew. You're not going to walk in, and you're going to see a closet full of brooms and mops, right? Well, at least that's the way it's supposed to be, right? But signs are important. But now Daniel is growing up, right? He's growing up. So some of the other signs that um, he's looking at are these signs here. <laughs> you seen these signs before? Yeah. Look familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we have uh, age for what? And that wheelchair is for what? Is there any confusion? Are you confused about that sign? Oh, uh, R and R. Look at that R and R. What is that? Railroad and crossings. And well, how about the sign that has a circle with a, um, like a, a red circle? And then it has a cross. Well, not a cross, but a line across 
left or right, like here. What does that mean? That means no, right? What does this mean? Are you confused? <laughs> no confusion there? When you see a sign to stop, what does that mean? Stop, you stop, right? How about this one? Don't enter. What happens if you do enter? <laughs> You're in trouble, right? Yeah. No U-turns. Um, how about the, this right here, one and nine? Is that telling you something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. These, these are roads. If you want to go on another road, you're not going to say, okay, let me go to this one. The signs are here, right? They keep us safe. They guide you through your trips. And even sometimes on top of these signs, there are more signs, right? Because sometimes people, construction workers are out there. So sometimes you even have um, guys with slow and then like stop and slow because they, they block one lane. And then the guys like this, I don't know if you ever seen them, and they're telling you to, to, to stop, or to slow down. They direct you. And all, all this is in place to keep you safe. Everything has to be in order. Everything has to, if everybody doesn't follow the signs, what happens? Right? Now, what if somebody said, oh, why are you looking at that sign? I don't, go, I, I don't obey signs. What do you want to think about that person? Crazy? Not crazy, really. But disobedient, right? Right? What if they tell you, ah, those signs that, that, that are up there, that's a mistake. <laughs> you see that stop sign? Don't listen to that. That's a mistake. And you say to yourself, wait a minute. There's a stop sign there. Why am I going to go through it? But somebody's telling me that's a mistake. Mm. Is there such a thing? Do people say that? No, because if there's a stop sign there, somebody put it there for a reason, right? Yes. And we should obey it. Yes. If you want to go home and you want to go south and you take a sign that goes north, are you going to get home? No, no you're going to go the opposite direction. Well, John the Baptist wanted a sign. He wanted to know who was the Messiah. Did he get it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he got it. He got it from who? God himself. That's right. Christ was there. God the Father was there. And who else? Holy Spirit. And what was Christ doing? <coughs> baptized. Right. right? So Christ was getting baptized. And so what happens when somebody gets baptized? That's a sign, isn't it? That the person has left the self. Who gives the sign? God. And who else? You have Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. They're all there. The Bible tells us that Christ is coming soon. Do we see signs? Yeah. We see signs, right? What kind of signs? Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence. I wrote pesticides. <laughs> pestilence, famines, disease, right? People who are disobedient, children who are going hungry and sometimes they die, right? And also there's famine with the gospel, right? People are traveling here and too, can't get a sermon. <laughs> All these are signs that Christ is coming soon. But what if people say, ah, oh, don't worry about the cancer, don't, don't, it's okay. Don't worry about the drug abuse. Forget about those signs. When you say to yourself, wait a minute, but I see with my own eyes signs. And yet people are saying to forget about those signs. Keep living the way you live. Don't worry about it. Everything is going to be OK. God, in, God is going to fix it in heaven. What do you think about those people that are telling you not to trust the signs of God, but yet the signs of man we have to obey? Is something wrong with that? Signs are good, yes. and we should obey them. But what about the signs of God? Should we obey those too? The truth of the matter is people are playing the fool because they say that there is no God. What do you say? You want to play the fool too? Are you going to listen to the signs, or are you going to obey the voice of man? God said, this is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. 
And so what are you going to do? The sign is there. And so who's Christ? Are you going to obey him? Why not? The sign is there. If you do not obey the traffic signs, something bad could happen. But what about if you don't obey the signs of God? What's going to happen at the end? Judgment. And so all those signs that God has been giving you, you've been, okay, putting it off, ignoring them. And then judgment comes. What's going to happen? You're not going to make it to heaven, right? Because we refuse to obey the signs. And so in life, we have um, all kinds of signs, wonderful signs that direct us, that guide us, that's there to keep us safe. And this is a good thing. And in the Word, in the Bible, there's also signs that we can see and we can experience in our own life. So let us not play a fool, right? Whether we're young or old, being a fool is not fun. Let's go to heaven. Let us obey the signs. Precious in the sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So let's not ignore the signs, okay? Um, the, the Bible brings across this point that the tithes and offering is used to forward uh, the, the preaching of the gospel and to bring the gospel forward. But it is also not only to, to bring the gospel forward, but also so that we may receive a blessing also. There's a blessing in us um, give, offering up our tithes and offering. The Bible says that we should bring all the tithes into the store out, that there may be meat in my house. Um, and prove me now wherewith say the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It also says, and I will rebuke the devourers for your sake. And ye shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And if we believe these things, we have to believe that God is faithful and that he also will give us what he has promised. But God is asking us to also be faithful. As we prepare this morning to receive the tithes and offering, we invite Amber and Ernesto to come forward. This is the promise of God. There shall be seasons refreshed. And from the Savior above, showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we flee. <coughs> Let us pray. Whatever thy gifts may be, all that we have is thine own. I trust the Lord from thee. Amen. Father, we thank you for your blessing that you have granted unto us. We thank you for watching over us and for protecting us. We thank you for these um, tithes and offering that was returned. We ask that you may bless those who, who had to give. And I ask, O oh Lord, that those that didn't have to give, that you may also bless them, that they may be able to um, have to give also. Pray, O oh Lord, that as we, you receive from us what we have um, returned to you faithfully, I pray, O oh Lord, that the gospel may go forward also faithfully. I pray that you may continue to bless us as a church, as an institution. And I pray that you may be with us, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. The Bible also says that we receive not because we do not ask. And sometimes, you know, as a child growing up, I know I come to a point where you ask. And the reason why you ask is because you're open to receive. And so I believe that the Bible has given uh, here to say that we need to ask. So we come to God and ask, not as a, 
as a, a, a parent who is just going to give us all our needs, things that are going to be hurtful to us, but we ask because God is a parent who is faithful, who know all our needs and know what's best for us. So this morning, we, as we prepare to pray, we open for prayer requests, and we one prayer request is to remember to for God to be with the the grubs as they're in um, in New York and pray for the our endeavor as our dear endeavor as they start out in um, New York pray that the gospel may go spread its wing and go forward as we see that you know there's a great need you know as you say that as wickedness increase so we know that know that the gospel is needed more and we live in a time period where it's um, very wicked so um, this morning we open up for prayer requests for Nandi, um, who just lost her best friend, and to be with her family, and um, for Thanksgiving that I made it through <laughs> one month of orientation. Yes. So Geneva's um, co-worker Nandi, um, she just lost her um, a friend, a good friend, and Geneva, she just completed one month of orientation. It's of days, which is unusual because she generally works night for the last probably 11, 10, 11 years. So to do a month of days, it's, she get to come home and and see what it is to sleep at, in, in her bed at night. <laughs> I'm happy, right? Everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah, any other um, prior requests? Brian Nesta. Yes, uh, for some missing members. Any other? With that, we... No other prayer requests? Okay. Yes, my mom is returning, um, was it tonight or tomorrow morning, something like that. She's she's returning. She has been on vacation for what, almost two months now. <laughs> so um, not vacation. She went home. It's, it's a vacation whenever you went home, go home anyhow. So she's been in Jamaica for the past um, two months. I pray that she may have safe traveling mercy and that she may make it back here safely um, tonight. And as we get ready to pray, we'll sing um, hymn number uh, 671. Being with us and for your guidance and your protection, even when we have been so outward against you, yet still you have drawn us back to you yourself. I pray, O oh Lord, that you may please be with us as we go through this divine service. May you continue to be with us as we strive to be more like you. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the blessing that you have given to us where we can come and be in your midst today. We ask that you may also be with um, the pastor and his wife as they're in New York today. May you bless them. And I pray those who are listening to, the, to his words, that the words that you have given him to speak, that they may find lodgment and that the gospel, as we've read, that it may go about and that many may bless and come to know you more. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we see that, as we live in a time period in this world where we see that wickedness increase, I pray, O oh Lord, that we may not get weary of doing good and to do that which is right. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your blessing that you have allowed us to be able to partake in, in finishing this gospel and finishing this work. I pray, O oh Lord, that we may realize that we are called to do a work, not what the world is doing, but the work which is a, a very humble work, 
where we have called to go and preach the gospel to the, those who are downtrodden, to the oppressed, and even to those who are enlightened. But I pray, O oh Lord, that you may help us, that we may see that we, we, we are unprofitable servants. We just do what you have commanded us to do. I ask you, Lord, that you may be with our members who are missing. May you continue to guide them and continue to protect them wherever they may be today. May you be with um, um, Nandi, um, Geneve's co-worker, who have lost her loved one. I pray our, our close friend. Pray, O oh Lord, that you may um, comfort her and let her know that um, in life, um, things happen in life and you lost loved one, but it's, it's even more important that we may know that we have a Savior who is not only with us, but is there to guide us and to protect us and to help us that we may know that this life may end, but it's not the hand on all. There's hope in the great after where we, can, we know that they, um, you're able to raise those who have called up on you and those who are faithful, that we may be able to um, raise again in the end. I pray, O oh Lord, that you may continue to be with um, Sister Geneve, may you continue to be with her and watch over her. And I pray, O oh Lord, that as she start this um, new position, that she may know that um, in every difficulty, you have a way of bringing relief, of which we know not of. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you may continue to strengthen her. And I thank you, O oh Lord, for allowing her to be able to have gone through um, this past month. And I pray um, not only for the blessing that um, you have offered to us as a family, but what you have offered to us as a church, where we see that um, even the church has come closer, where we could depend on our members to, um, for helping and in this past month. I pray, O oh Lord, that you may continue to be with us as a church may continue to watch over us. And I pray, O oh Lord, that even the time period where we're living in, that we may not become distracted. I ask you, in the name of Jesus, for these blessings, for Christ's sake, amen. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Incline the ears to and grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen. You know, it's one thing when you pray and then you see prayer answer. It's like instantly. And for those who don't know, we're praying for some missing members and we opened and they showed up. <laughs> so that's a blessing. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians um, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as their children, Walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and, an, and, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. May God add a blessing to his words. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are uh, grateful today. Uh, that we're here alive again. Um, it's only through thy power and mercy that we do the things that we do for you. We ask thee, Lord, that we realize that we have in us of nothing good to give, only through thy power and through thy strength, uh, that we can do anything uh, that's uh, really uh, pure and wonderful. We ask thee, Lord, at this time that we reflect on thy characters and all the things that you have to offer for us in this life because of thy sacrifice. We thank you for those that are online. And we pray for, uh, again, all those people that are truly searching for something better than, than what the world has to offer. Amen. Uh, of course, in Christ we pray. Um, I was going uh, sort of back and forth today. Um, actually, not today, but during the week as to if I should put imagery and pictures and things like that. And uh, just like that, 20 minutes ago, I said, ah, let me put a picture up. And, and because I'm going to uh, look into the sanctuary. 
And um, one of the reasons why I was going back and forth is that uh, I, w I want to focus more on the contact and on the, on the message of what that symbol represents. Um, but again, next time I'll, I'll have a um, picture, uh, maybe s hopefully a brief little film on, on the sanctuary. Uh, today I want to focus not so much on the whole sanctuary as a whole, but just on one particular um, section, which is the altar. And that's where all the sacrifices um, went on, and, and, and more specifically, the offerings. What, the, what was the offerings about? What, were, what did they mean, and what lessons do they have for us today? Um, first thing is, what was the purpose for the sanctuary? Well, the, the, the sanctuary was basically um, for God to dwell among his people, right? Um, of course, we know that God cannot be contained in any tent or any um, church. But the fact of the matter is, is that they spent so long in Egypt, 400 years. Think about it. You spend four hours somewhere. What kind of influence are you going to get? Think about 400 years. And that influence was very strong. We're talking about um, language, culture, religious worship, teachings, philosophies. These things were in the minds and in the heart of God's people. So what did God have to do? God had to take his people out of that situation. Isn't that what we have to do today to witness to somebody? Do we go to the bar? and witness to somebody about alcohol, they have to be away from that situation and be put in another situation where that influence cannot enter into their minds. God had to take his people into the wilderness to teach them uh, something better, a different pattern, because they were used to something else. Remember that um, they were slaves, so what happened on the Sabbath? They had to work. So think about working every Sabbath for 400 years, generation after generation. And now, now God is trying to teach them something different. So they have to be away from the influence. The sanctuary was a special place where God's people can meet for worship. But it had to be done according to God's will and God's direction. And then, only then, God will meet them there. The area of the sanctuary was separated by a tent, by actually not the tent, the curtain, right? It separated the holy from the unholy. Because when the service was put in place, heaven and earth touch. So an area for the sanctuary was only for specific use, which was for worship. It wasn't used for common things. Um, there's different uh, measurements that I've seen. I remember 50 by 100, or 75 by 150. But it was uh, rectangular, and it had to be small enough because they had to be transported. Remember, the children of Israel were wandering. So they had to take the sanctuary down and take it with them wherever they went. And there were different uh, families within the priesthood that were specifically responsible for every piece of furniture. They said, wonderful, very organized. This is, that's the way the church should be organized today. Of course, as you know, the inside the sanctuary was divided into three parts. Uh, the outer court, the holy place, and then the most holy. But again, we're going to um, uh, focus more on the offerings that were made on the altar. And the altar um, was in the front. Um, it was uh, seven and a half about wide, four and a half feet high. So it was a big piece of furniture. The fire on the altar was... Um, given by God from heaven, but the priests were responsible to keep it going. So there were priests in charge of the wood. See, the wood that they used could not have any insects. The wood, could, the wood cannot, couldn't be rotted. The wood had to be kept clean in good shape. 
The coal from the altar was taken to the uh, golden um, altar that was used to heat the incense, uh, offered to God every morning and evening inside. That's where the prayers were given. The altar was made out of copper, which uh, symbolized judgment. And the lamb that was uh, burnt was pointed and reminded people of Christ to be the substitute. So we don't have to be burned in the final judgment. One thing I find interesting about the altar, it was the first thing that you saw when you went into the sanctuary. And imagine all those little children walking by the sanctuary seeing the burning altar. That's what they saw. Think about the questions they must have asked their parents. What is that? What, why, why is that all the sacrifices? And so I can just imagine the parents telling their children already at two, three, four years old, explaining to them what this piece of furniture did. That's the first thing they saw. So that's going to be the first thing they're going to ask for. Questions. What is that? Why is that uh, going on? Wonderful education. The altar was the first thing they saw. It was the biggest. It had a fire. It was elevated um, because the fire had to keep going. Air had to go in from the bottom and come up. And everybody that came into the sanctuary had to stop at the altar. It was the beginning of the journey, and it could not be bypassed. Why can, couldn't it be bypassed? Why can't you just go to the labor and into the sanctuary? Because that's where sin is dealt with. Sin is dealt with in every part, but when you come into the altar, you see what sin has done. So sin deals, the altar, I'm sorry, deals with sin and the result that it had. So in the mind of the people, there had to be a change in lifestyle. The sanctuary is a study, um, and this is more what, what I have here today, just a bit, a more of a study. And it's, it's a study because I think that sometimes we end up in the wilderness, and we can understand life, and we're having difficulties. And the place to start is here, in the brazing altar. Uh, we have to be aware of sins and consequences, and to worship freely. We have a right to... Um, look into these things. The Spirit of Prophecy says that the sanctuary message is something that we should understand. On the altar, um, there were several animals that were sacrificed. Uh, there was an oxen, which uh, symbolized service and strength. The sheep, of course, we know uh, who that symbolizes, which is Christ, and that um, was also symbolic of meekness and purity and obedience. Goats, sin and judgments, pigeon, of course, symbolizes poverty, and turtle doves, which is innocence. And so no matter who you were or um, what's your status in, 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 the, in society, whether you were rich or poor, you had something to bring to the altar. And now we're going to go into the uh, main... Um, study, which is the five offerings that were um, done at the altar. And so the first one, um, the first verse, we're going to go into Leviticus, and then um, after that, we're going to go into the New Testament so we can get a better, uh, deeper understanding of what that offering meant and what lessons did it have. Uh, the first um, offering is found in uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 1. And as we continue the offering, it's, it's chapter 1, chapter 2, and so forth. And in chapter, uh, Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 3 says, If his offerings be a burnt uh, sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it with his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Let us go to our scripture, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 1 and 2, more specifically 2. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love 
as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. So here we have the highest aspect of the work of Christ where he is seen offering himself up entirely to God to do his will, even unto death. The whole offering, except the skin of the animal, was burnt upon the altar, and all went up to God as a sweet Savior. It pictures Christ who gave himself as a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior again. Christ is seen here not only as bearing our sins, but accomplishing the Father's will, glorifying him and vindicating the holiness and majesty of his throne because his life reflected the word of God. Now, what is the purpose here? We know that the burnt offering is very, very significant. And, it's the, um, it, and it didn't originate with the sanctuary. Remember what happened right after sin? What was, what was killed? Two lambs, right? So right off the bat, the, the, this, in, this, this um, action that was taking place, a lamb was sacrificed. And then Abraham, remember Abraham? Everywhere he went, there was an altar. Right? And so when people will come, they will see the altar, they will say, oh, Abraham sacrificed here. Church, where's the altar? Isn't it here, right? This is where sin should be dealt with, right? The tithes, when they come, right? The offerings, right here. This is where we pray. This is where everything is officiated. And of course, in, in the sanctuary, um, the purpose, again, uh, let me go back to that. It was atonement for sin. Right? It was an expression of devotion. It was a commitment and complete surrender to God. Now let's think back. How does, uh, how does this help us today? What does it teach us? Well, when you do something, how are we supposed to do it? You have to put your whole heart. Didn't Christ put his whole heart? The burnt offering, the whole animal was put in. Right? Of course, not everything, but... Oh, I'm sorry, uh, the whole offering. But... Everything was burnt. And so when you do something, you do it to the full extent of your strength. When Christ showed his love, he did, did, was he half, half-hearted? Ah, I'm going to love you a little bit. When we do something half-hearted, what happens? It, it just doesn't work out as, as good as we want it to, right? Also, when Christ was, was died on the cross... Didn't he service us in, in, in a great way? Everything that Christ did was sweet, and the service was sweet. So when somebody serves us, isn't that nice? You know, this country is built on, on customer service, the business. And when you go into the, I mean, outside in the neighborhood and the community is different, right? People just walk by, they don't, you know, whatever. But when you go into... The, the, the store, even if it's the person you walk by and they didn't say anything to you, when you walk by that store, ah, how you doing? How can I help you? Right? Because they, they want some, really, they want their business, right? <laughs> that's, that's really why they're nice to you. Otherwise, sometimes they wouldn't even be nice to you. But it's a policy that service um, has to be satisfactory to the customer. And so when we receive service, isn't it nice? It's nice. You know, and if you pay a little bit more, you probably get better, <laughs> even better, right? So we have to service others the same way, the way Christ serves us. How about Christ and his love, his pardoning goodness? How about that love that was the victory? These are, these are, uh, these are things that, that I learned. Well, how about the consequences of sin? When we do something that is wrong, don't we get consequences? How about when nobody's watching and we commit something wrong? No cameras, right? Nobody's around. It's just us, me. And, and some, a sin is committed. What happens? Do we still suffer? Okay, we, we, we have, you know, it written on the, on the record, right? But what happens to us? Is something's going on in our minds? Yeah, yeah. We hear sirens like, oh, wait a minute, are they coming for me? And like, everybody's looking at you, what's wrong with you? No, yeah, I don't know, I just heard a siren. I said, yeah, but, you know, we hear siren all the time. 
Yeah, but this time I sinned. I took something. I'm afraid they might be after me. So we pay the consequences. And this is what the burnt offering should, should teach us, that there are consequences of, for sin. So why not live righteous? Right? One of the things I, um, I think about the burnt offering is, is the takeaway lesson, which is sacrifice, um, to show love and to show that somebody you care, to minister to them. And one example I think about is, is when somebody gives up their, their plans and their will for life and they take care of somebody else. Isn't that what parents do? A lot of times. This is what I think about. This is why Mother's Day, you know, people are so wonderful, right? On Father's Day, it's a lot of collect calls. But on Mother's Day, the people go and visit and, you know, because the mothers are very loving, very, they sacrifice a lot. And so when I think about the burnt offering, I think about, yes, you know, the consequences of sin. But I also think about what is the significance? What is it that is trying to get me to do? to live righteous and to serve others and to do it with all my heart. That's, that's the message that we should be taking out of this um, offering. If you want to uh, study more, Psalms chapter uh, 40 and the Gospel of John talks more about um, the offering. The next one is found in Levit Leviticus chapter 2. Remember I said we're going to go to Leviticus. And the next offering is found in that chapter. And in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 1 it says, And when they will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of a fine flour, and shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. Let us go to John chapter 4 and verse 34. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, it says, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. This offering is significant because Christ, it means that Christ is a perfect and sinless man. And he is presented to us a wonderful person, and his spotless life was, was an offering, and it was sweet unto God. Here there was no um, shedding of blood in this offering uh, because it, it points more to the perfection of Christ's life rather than his death. The fine flower pictures his sinless humanity and his moral qualities. The oil pictures the grace of the power of the Holy Spirit which of course characterize again the life of Christ. While the frankincense is symbolic of the sweetness and the fragrance of his person and his life. Now what's the purpose for this? Of course it's, it's the recognition of God's goodness and his provisions. And also keep in mind that every offering is, is pointing to Christ, but it's also um, calling for us to worship voluntarily. So when we see the goodness of God, when we see the provisions, it should, in our minds, trigger something, right? Thankfulness, worship. Now, what, what does it um, teach us today, this offering of meat or meal? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is how we deal with each other. Wherever Christ was, it was sweet, right? So shouldn't it be the same with us? You know, a lot of people are, um, are so selfish. But here is teaching us that we should be generous in giving. That we should live a simple lifestyle free from, the, from bad influences. Because after all, we, we make a lot of money, right? And if we are involved with bad influences, what's going to happen? We're going to do, do the wrong thing sometimes. And the next thing that it teaches me here today is that when Christ was around, everything was sweet. There was nothing lacking. There was no sickness, death, or pain. Remember that um, Christ offered what? A meal, a meat offering. One thing um, also that comes to mind is the, that one sacrifice that Christ made was enough. It was perfect. 
You know, everything that God did was perfect. And so, you know, when we eat out, we sort of like, if we do it enough, don't we miss that home meal? He said, man, I, I wish I was, you know, back home so I can eat that, that home meal from my mom or from whoever it was because it's, it's different. What's the difference? You would think that that chef studied and worked so hard to make that perfect thing there look like beautiful, not only taste good, but look beautiful. But then if you do it enough, you sort of start missing that home meal because that meal was offered with love. That guy, he's, he's good, but he's doing it for another a reason. He's there so he can make money, right? He needs to pay his bill. He probably goes home and eat at home. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but it's good, though, when we can take a little bit of, of uh, food from home and eat it for lunch. Isn't that good, right? Or if, even if it's raw, right? It's good. Yeah. So Christ's goodness. And also, um, I bring in, in my mind, I think about also the prayers that uh, God answers, you know. God provides for us also through answering our prayers. You know, when we pray for something and we get it, we say, oh, thank you, God. And then sometimes we don't get it, we still thank him. Because sometimes when we pray for something, right, we don't know what we want sometimes. And we pray for something that we think is good and Christ holds back. And we don't get it, we still praise him. So God provides all things, even when he doesn't give it to us. He's still providing. So how can we provide for others? Um, a lot of people say, well, we have to give, right? Well, sometimes, can we give something that's free? Is that, is that, is, is that um, something that exists? Give something that's free? Yeah, I think so. How much does a smile cost? Huh? Actually, you know, smiling is good for you. It keeps you looking younger, less wrinkles, as opposed to a frown. We use twice the muscles, right, maybe three times when we frown, and then when we smile, we use half, right? So we all should have dimples. You know when you smile, you get those dimples? When you say hello, how much did that cost? It's not, nothing. When you say a word of encouragement, how much did that cost? How about common courtesy? You know, somebody's coming in the bus and you gave up your seat. That doesn't cost anything, right? A little pain? Nah. We're old men, right? We could give up our seat. That's right. <laughs> If we're always there to help, and people know we're always there to help, even in the little things, doesn't that make them happy? Yeah. You know, we never know what the person is going through. Sometimes a person is going through so much, and uh, they're in fight mode all the time. It's just part of the way they work, always fighting, always complaining. But when you come and you say something nice, or you give uh, an encouragement, doesn't that, it breaks it down? They start to say, well, yeah, God is good. Maybe I should be happy. But God's goodness in this um, offering is the takeaway lesson for me. Uh, God is good in all he provides, his provisions. And so because of this, I can worship freely. I can devote my life to him because I know that he'll look after me. The third offering comes from Leviticus chapter 3. And we can read verse 1. Again, this is just a basic um, introduction on the offerings uh, there's a whole lot more, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, of the different offerings and what, and, and, and what they teach and, and what is the significance of the offering. This offering is the peace offering, number three, which is found in chapter three in verse one. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it to, of the herd, whether it be a male or female, it shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. All right, so Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse uh, 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who have made both 
one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. This was an offering of sweet Savior. They're all offerings of sweet Savior. Um, the blood, the fat, and the kidneys of the offering were put upon the altar as the food uh, of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. Uh, this was separate. This was God part. And then the breast was given to Aaron and his son. And then the right shoulder, um, I read, that was offered to the, pe to the priests. Um, so both God uh, and, and man both fed of the same offering, which speaks of communion and fellowship. Um, this brings into mind, of course, communion, uh, which the, the, the member of Christ enjoys. And so this is enjoyed on, on the ground that Christ has worked on. He did it on the cross, and his blood was shed there for our sins. And so we are at peace with God through the work of the cross and can feed upon Christ in fellowship with the Father. So what is the purpose, of course? Uh, thanksgiving and fellowship. Isn't it good when people can get together and fellowship? You know, in this country, um, um, people have take one day, their week, third Thursday, I believe, in November, to um, have a meal. Right? It's called Thanksgiving because people um, have this thing about fellowship, right? Isn't it funny that everybody has a desire for this and people travel and they go through all extremes to spend that one day with family. Also, uh, this peace offering um, is, brings into mind that anybody who's been in war um, whether overseas and any kind of war. We have a lot of war we, in this country and the history of the nation. Um, so pe people are very familiar with war, and anybody who's been in war knows better than there's nothing more um, um, fulfilling than peace. If you've been in war, um, it doesn't matter with, um, it, even if it wasn't overseas, if you're fighting with someone, whether it's at work, you know, wherever it is, um, it doesn't feel good afterwards. You said to yourself, man, um, peace is good, you know? Isn't it good that you can go to church and just have peace? Amen. That you can just sit down? Uh, let me read the Word of God. Let me listen to some, some Bible. You said to yourself, oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm at peace. It was war during the week at work or wherever, but now I have peace. Peace is important. You can do things during peace that you cannot do during war. Can you build during war? You can't build during war. But can you build during peace? Can you build a life on the peace? You know, think about those refugees in Syria. Think about the people that are still there. Every day, they don't have peace. They can't do anything. There's two, there's two things you can do during a war. Fight or run. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm out of there. Hopefully I'm out of there before the war starts. <laughs> but I'm, I'm running. Okay, not going to run fast. So you know that war is not, I'm not going to take part in no war. Because I know there's only losers in war. Even when sometimes people win, they lose. You say, you say no, but they got the stuff. Yeah, they got the stuff, but what, what, what is in their mind now? All the carnage and all the experiences that they had to go through. Right? The money is left and gone, but they still have those memories. You can't build church during war. People fighting. Church is not enjoyable, it's not fulfilling. How about a career? You go to work, there's always something going on. Can you build? No. Not if there's stealing going on. Not if there's fighting between management. Uh, what if you always um, told, I'm a lady, we're going to do layoffs, the struggles. I say, oh, wow, I can't have no peace. I can't build my career. I can't come to work and just do my job. But during peace, what can you do? During peace, right? I'm, and I mean, you can take a nap during peace, right? And that's good, but I'm talking about other things. I'm talking about accumulating good memories, when you're at peace, you can spend time with people, enjoy their company, and those memories continue to build and build and build. 
Think about during peace, the forgiveness and the goodness of others, right? During war, people are not thinking about saying I'm sorry. They're thinking about killing somebody or fighting, right? But during peace, people reflect on the things they have done. Say, you know what, I'm sorry about that time. And the person sometimes even forgets. It's like, what? Yeah, remember that, that time, you know, I did this and that. And you're like, uh, yeah, whatever. I'll take your apology, but I wasn't, I even forgot about that. But during peace, these things come to mind. And so, when there's peace, there's a lot of compassion. But during war, there's no compassion. Christ is our intercessor, and he stands in my defense, and I am reconciled to God. And that gives me peace. War can lead to a lot of afflictions when people do not humble themselves. But with prayer, repentance, and turning away from sin, we can enjoy peace and come together. In the Bible, we have examples of peace. Remember Jacob and Laban? I hope I'm saying that right. Laban. Or Laban was always changing his, um, his uh, salary, you know. And Jacob um, had to be out there. And sometimes he didn't sleep. Sometimes he felt sleepy. The co a cold wind will come. And what happened to his sleep? It will go away. And so during that time of of, um, of trouble and working hard. Remember Jacob who was deceived, given the wrong bride? All right? But Jacob continued trusting God and he continued to work. And so at the end when they made the treaty, wasn't that nice? You know, Laban could have killed Jacob. But instead they made peace. So peace is beneficial to us, to our physical health and our spiritual health. It, we can heal during peace. But during war, we cannot do these things. And peace is being Christ-like. In, in Psalms 85, you can read more on that. It's a um, very informative chapter on peace. The next uh, offering is on Leviticus chapter 4. Let me go back there. I'm in Ephesians. In Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against them any of them. Of course, this is the sin offering. All right? And then in verse 3, it says, If the priest that is anointed to do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which has sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Um, so the whole bullock um, was being burnt. Now, when you think about the altar, I said before it was like seven and a half by seven and a half. So it was like um, a square. And then it was like a four, about four and a half feet high. And then it was elevated. And you said to yourself, oh, that's pretty big, right? It was the biggest uh, furniture in the sanctuary. But have anybody seen an uh, oxen or a bullock? You know how big this animal is? It's like, what, 2,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds? I've seen an oxen before. I, could, I, just, I just couldn't believe the, the um, that size of this animal. At the hump, it was like six feet. Right here, the hump. I'm not going to buy it. Just here, because I saw the man walking with that uh, big um, animal, and I couldn't believe how docile it was. And the man was just... You know, he had like a little uh, long twig. He was going like this, and the oxen were just, and this animal was huge. And the man was about six feet. And the hump reached up to his, his head, and I was looking at it. I said, I can't believe how big that is. But what are we dealing with? What kind of offering is, is here? It's sin. And so this offering was for sin, and it pictures to us Christ, who was made sin for us, and endured the judgment and wrath of God against sin and our stead as our substitute. So, the holiness of God and the awfulness of sin are brought out in the bullock being entirely burnt up outside the camp. So what is the purpose of, of the sin offering? When, when somebody is, is, when the priest is holding that 
bullock or that oxen, and he's going to sacrifice us. You're like, oh, man, what did this man do now? He lost his mind? What's going on? You know, you think that's a sin offering. That means something's going on. And when you, when you have a bullock and you're going with a bullock, all right, everybody sees you. Hey, you can't hide that bullock. It's not like a turtle dove. You can put it in here. It's my turtle dove. There you go. You know, this is a bullock. You know, this thing is like very clumsy. You know, you can't hide that bullock. And so how you, how somebody might feel. He says, man, I better not do this again no more. <laughs> I don't want to go through this over, you know, because you got to walk like a mile to the sanctuary you know, with this big bullock. So confession of sin, right? It's important. Confession of sin. And don't do the sin no more. And so when this offering was placed, it was uh, forgiveness for sin and also a cleansing from defilement. What are the lessons here? What is the lesson here? Of course, the sin offering paid the debt in, in, in full, pointing to Christ. You know, we can't, um, we can't pay this, this debt. And only Christ can do it. So this brings into mind the, the great sacrifice of Christ and what it, what it does for me. But it also brings, um, despite the fact that I'm, I'm happy for this um, offering, what Christ has done for me, it also brings into my mind my weakness and my failures before God and before everybody. And how important it is to rely and to pray on the Holy Spirit to guide me. And not to, not to do evil, but to be bent on doing good. And also, it's important for us to ask for forgiveness, to pray, and have a desire to reform. Um, many uh, people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church just want to pray. That's it. They want to be, be like prayer warriors. And so you, they become prayer warriors, but they don't become reform warriors. So um, I think that uh, reform warriors need to take uh, place after being a prayer warrior so we can be a, a gentle warrior and a courtesy warrior and, uh, and a God-fearing warrior and a Bible study warrior, you know, and, and all that good warrior stuff that comes after the prayer warrior. Amen. So the lesson for me is that we have a substitute that paid for my sins. But there is something that is required of me. I have to accept Christ, right, as my Savior and live according to his will. So it pictures um, Christ forsaken of God and as our sin bearer. It's in Psalms 22. talks a little bit about that and also uh, Mark's um, gospel. The last offering for the study is the fifth offering, and it, and it comes... Um, to us in the next chapter 5 and in verse 6 it says and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he had sinned a female from the flock a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin so let's go to 1 John chapter 2 In 1 John chapter 2, let me go there, um, verse 2, it says, And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for our own only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here is sin looked on as trespass against the government of God. And so when someone sins against the government of God, there has to be amends for that wrong that was done. And so in this offering, a fifth part had to be added to it. Atonement was made by the blood of the offering, and the trespasser was forgiven. Um, and this offering represents Christ, who died for our sins and trespasses on the cross, restoring that which he took not away. He was not only answering to God for, our, um, for sins and pay our debt by his blood, but a fifth part was added, as it were, bringing more glory to God and more blessings to the man than were, than were had before the sin was committed. 
And so this, this was uh, interesting to me because the, sin, the trespass offering was similar to the sin offering, but the main difference was the trespass offering was offering of money for sins of ignorance connected with fraud. Um, one example is maybe somebody who cheated unintentionally, another out of money or property. The sacrifice had to be equal to the amount plus a fifth to the priest and to the one offended. And I did the math, and so we're calculating about 40%. So the trespass offering had to be done um, in accordance to God's will, and it was expensive. Because in this offering, the person had to make restitution of at least 20%, even if it was unintentional. What is the lesson here? God does not like fraud. There was other things involved in it, but I, I chose to focus on this because there's a lot of oppression and stealing from the poor. And so in the Bible, if someone um, repents, they'll say, oh, I'll give five times more, Right? Because God has forgiven the person, they say, I'll, I'll, I'll give five times more back, right? And so stealing is serious. God, God does not like stealing from anybody. And so when we sin, we're doing it against the government of God. Remember Joseph? He said, how can I do this great sin? against my God? Are there any examples in the Bible about people um, being put to death because of stealing? Achan? What did God tell the children of Israel? Don't touch anything in that city. What did Achan do? He took some garments, some gold, I believe some silver, and hid it in his tent. And who helped him? His family helped them. So, did his family steal? Yes. Yeah, well, they were there. They were like an accessory, right? Do we have those laws today? Yes. Sure, sure. Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? They, they sold property and they promised to give, and they didn't do it. They hold back when they died. Sin of stealing is very serious. Nobody likes a thief. Nobody likes to, to have something stolen from them that they work so hard for. Nobody likes something being taken away from them that they worked hard for. From my experience, it has been that um, the person that steals eventually will have it stolen from them. And sometimes what makes me laugh is that uh, in the neighborhood, when two guys get together to steal something, one guy steals it from the other guy <laughs> because you cannot trust a thief. There's no honor among thieves. So stealing is it's just something that it just doesn't work. And so today, do we have stealing going on? Of course. Are they going to pay for it? Sooner or later, they're going to pay for it. Sooner or later. They might enjoy the, the, the fruits for a little season, but what happens to their children? We have to be very careful with uh, what we do. So let's review. The first offering, the burnt offering, what did that bring sin to mind, the takeaway lesson? It's Christ offered himself for our sins. And so today, we only think of Christ because he's the only one that can be offered. The second one is the meat or the meal offering. How does that help us today? What, can, what brings it into our minds? Christ is the bread of life. He's the one that sustains us physically and spiritually. How about the peace offering? What, what, brings, what helps us today to live right? What comes into our minds with the peace offering? Who's peace? Christ. So Christ makes peace on our behalf also. So it's only through Christ that we can have peace. The sin offering. This brings into mind Christ's atoned for our fallen nature on the cross. 
and he secured for us a spot if we desire it. So what, what brings into our minds? What lessons do we have today of the sin offering? We can have eternal life. Number five, the trespass offering. What, what lesson do we learn from this? Well, one lesson that I learned is that wrongdoers against the weakest and most vulnerable members of society will be punished if they don't come up front and, and pay restitution to what they have stolen. We all here feel the oppression in one way or another of somebody, a billionaire, not paying taxes, whether we know it or not. It affects society. And when you have one, two, 40, 80 billionaires not paying taxes, we feel it. Christ offends the poor and the weak. All these offerings are to bring us closer to God, to, to help us understand his love, to help us understand the, the, the consequences of sin and not to sin, to live righteous. The silken cord that binds heart, June 19, it says, I'm going to read, it's, it's like one, two, four paragraphs. I'm just going to read a little bit section of it. But it says, we need to have a higher and more distinct view of the character of Christ. We are not to think of God only as ju a judge and to follow him as a loving father. Nothing can do our soul greater harm than this, for our whole spiritual life is molded from our conceptions of God's character. This is what the sanctuary message does. It reveals to us the character of God. That's the purpose of the sanctuary and what we have to do in order to change. We have lessons to learn of Jesus' love. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior, Ephesians 1 and 2, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. I continue on to say one more uh, sentence. This is the height of the love we are required to reach. And the texture of his is not tainted with selfishness. So, talking about the sanctuary is um, very interesting um, to me. I've, I, one time I came to church and there was someone who was presenting about the sanctuary. He told me that when he heard the sanctuary message, that's when he decided to be a Seventh-day Adventist with the sanctuary message. And so ever since then, I say to myself, is, still, is it still happening today? Do people hear about the sanctuary message and are being converted and convinced that Christ is God? And I say yes. So every time I present anything on the sanctuary, this is in the back of my mind. Who's committing their lives to, to Christ right now because of this special message? So even though right now the sanctuary message to many it seems insignificant, right? And they've, they said, no, this is not, this is Old Testament stuff. We don't deal with that anymore. It's still significant because the symbolic um, symbols point to the only one that can save us, which is Jesus Christ. Our closing M is number 604, We Know Not the Hour. Please stand. We know not the hour of the Master's appearing, yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. When he shall return, tis a promise most cheering. But we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know not the hour. 
There is light for the wise who are seeking salvation. There is truth in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation, but we know not the hour he will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know not the hour. We'll watch and we'll pray with our lamps trimmed and burning. We'll work and we'll wait till the Master's returning. We'll sing and rejoice, every omen discerning, but we know not the hour. He will come, let us watch and be ready, He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, He will come in the of his father's bright glory but we know not the hour let us pray father we thank you O lord for being the ultimate sacrifice for us we thank you O lord we your call us to live a righteous life we know not when you're returning we know not when the time will run out. But we ask you, O oh Lord, that you may help us, that we may realize that today, if we hear your voice, that we may not harden our heart, that we may come today and repent and bring that sacrifice where you have called us, that we may, to, we may sacrifice those things which has drawn us away from you, that we may put them on the altar, that they may be burned. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we see that sometimes we have to, not sometimes, but all the time, we have to put ourselves first, that, that we may sacrifice ourselves because self draws us away from you. Yes. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we may encourage us, that we may do those things, which at times may seem so difficult for us to do, but in the end, it will bring us peace and it may bring us joy. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we heard this morning, that there are many different sacrifices. And there are many different sins. But I pray, O oh Lord, that we may realize that you are the Savior who have come and you have died so that we may be able to live with you again. I pray, O oh Lord, that today that we may be wise in heeding your voice and following you for Christ's sake. Amen. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy worship we go our way. Guide in life's conflicts all through the day. Save 